Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to this morning's webinar. Uh, this is an introduction to security in AWS. Um, as it says, it's very much an introductory level, uh, but we'll try and take through lots of different topics, things that are interesting to lots of customers and lots of people that I speak to out there. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping as we start. Um, really happy to take questions. Uh, we'll probably try and address those at the end just to make sure we have time to get through the full uh, amount of material. Um, but if you submit your questions through the portal there, uh, we'll pick those up and try and sort them out as we go. Okay, and um, just really briefly a little bit about myself. So my name is Matt Doherty, so I'm one of the architects here at Zen. I've been with the company for quite some time now, 14 and a half years. Um, and my background is working in networks and uh, also in cloud and hosting different services. So for the last five years or so, I've been working with AWS um, and I'm, I've been certified to various different levels. So I'm one of the, um, for the architect track, for example, um, at the professional level. And I've also been really fortunate to spend some time with different AWS architects and professional services teams, uh, specifically the security team, um, and also working with Well Architected. So I'll give you some more information about Well Architected, well Architected sorry, at the end of this session. Okay, so let's get right into it. So the first thing is here are some headlines that, that we tend to see. Don't get too many days in the press without seeing some of these different things happening to someone that's been unfortunate. So I don't know if any of these are particularly interesting to you, if you feel they are specific threats or if you had direct experience of them, but there are real concerns when it comes to information security, and these are just a few. Um, and then when we talk about AWS, it becomes a, an even greater talking point. I think a lot of the customers I speak to are really uncertain about how to deal with it, really. Uh, there are loads of reasons why we love working with AWS. Um, the scalability, the, the elasticity, and the instant access to all these different resources, um, these new tools, there's a real pace of movement, so hundreds, maybe thousands of new features and services being developed really rapidly. Um, we're trying to look to cultures where we empower people to be able to develop and test things and innovate quickly. Um, and of course, that means granting access to be able to do those things. And we have resources that come and go, they can be more transient, so where we look at those kind of auto scaling environments, something that grows and shrinks um, in real time and automatically in response to the live demands being placed on it. Um, it. It can be quite a daunting prospect to think about how you look after those things. So all these wonderful benefits also translate into some difficulties that we need to think about. I know when I first started working with AWS, there was a real perception problem and security was a reason why customers were thinking about not moving to the cloud. They just didn't trust it or didn't get it. And I think that increasingly that's, that, that kind of view is disappearing um, a lot, including myself, would argue that you can be more secure by using the likes of AWS. Um, but there's certainly no room for complacency. So we'll take you through a few things that we can, that we can consider here. Um, this is the shared responsibility model published by AWS. And I can't really do a security talk without going through this. It's really important to understand what AWS are responsible for and what customers are responsible for. We certainly don't want customers to think, as I say, that they are secure just by being in AWS. Everybody has their responsibility. So the part in green at the bottom, um, AWS are responsible for the cloud. So think of that in terms of the physical environment, data centers, uh, networking, the servers, the storage, the hypervisors, all those sorts of things. And AWS do that bit really well. Uh, it's designed for huge scale, highly automated. And AWS are able to invest an awful lot when it comes to security. Um, so everybody, all the different AWS customers get to benefit from that investment and from the, from the real world-class expertise that they can, they can put into this. And of course, it's highly certified too. So there are lots of different organizations that have been through and audited this um, and, and have given their views on that as well. So very strong from that perspective. And if you compare this to what you would do if you're operating on-premises or in your own data center, then it really removes a lot of the burden, both in terms of operations and security. So if you consider that AWS will manage and operate hosts and hypervisors and networks and all those sorts of things, then it's a, a job that you don't have to do. Um, when we look at the orange part of this slide, um, this is where customers are responsible for their operations within the cloud. So the message here is that it's your systems, your own operating systems, your, your own applications, the way that you configure those, your firewall policies, your passwords and credentials, your data. So we need to be careful with that. Um, AWS will give you some tools that can help here, and there's a lot of a lot of things that really should be familiar to organizations as well that you've been doing for a long time pre-cloud um, that, that are maintained here. 
Um, do bear in mind as well that this this diagram is a kind of moving target. So this is really pitched at the, in its current guise at services such as EC2, the equivalent of virtual machines in the cloud. Uh, so infrastructure is a service. There are lots of services that are more managed than that. So uh, platform as a service, software as services are the, are the different terms for that, I suppose. To give an example there, we have relational database service, which is a managed database, uh, as the name suggests. Um, so you might have a managed SQL server, MySQL, or something like that. And in this case, you don't have the operating system to manage. You don't have the application to manage in the same way. So really, um, the, the line moves, and AWS become responsible for more of the security. So do bear that in mind as you're looking at different products and services. The more, the, the deeper you go into those manage that management layer, uh, the more out of that responsibility you're outsourcing. Just before we get into the, the nitty gritty of some of this, I just wanted to mention this also. So this is about having a balanced approach. Um, I speak to a lot of customers that see security as a very specific thing. Uh, in my experience, it's often been a firewall, for example. So I have that firewall, it has some policies on it, I am therefore secure. Um, it might be other things as well, but the firewall is the common example. And really what I wanted to do was try and show that there's a, a wider view that you need to take here. Um, ideally, it starts with directives. So this is really defining what you aim to do, uh, what are your policies and your strategies and your guidance for those that are going to actually go and implement this. It might be looking at what your compliance obligations are. I'd be thinking about data classification schemas, which is really topical. Certainly a lot of customers talking GDPR still at the moment. Um, all of this, by the way, straight out of the AWS cloud adoption framework, which I'd really recommend taking a look at. We move into prevent, which is where most of the focus that I see uh, from customers is aimed really. So this is all about protection, stopping a bad thing from happening. Ideally, it should be interpreted from what your direct phase says, and it should absolutely be in depth. So you should have different layers of security here and different techniques. So we'll think here about identities, access management, um, network security, so firewalling and IDS, that sort of thing, and potentially encryption of data. Uh, moving into the second two, um, there is a view out there that you are going to be attacked or you will be compromised at some point in time. And actually the best that you can do or where you should place a lot of your energies in actually detecting that that has happened and being in a position where you can actually recover from that. So detect is all about identifying that, that event, the threat and attack, something that you really want to know about. So we'll be thinking here about things like logging, audit trails, alerting and so on. And then finally response, which is where we see a lot of customers really not adequately prepared. Um, so if you are under attack, if you are compromised, breached, what are you going to do? So this is thinking about that process up front, really, and the people skills that you'll need, the tooling, and really the various capabilities that you might have, and of course, the, the documentation to go along with that. Okay, we'll dive straight into VPC and network security. So for those of you that don't know, VPC, uh, Virtual Private Cloud, is your network in AWS, and it's where you're going to launch the majority of your resources, uh, and as such, it delivers, deserves a lot of attention. Uh, VPC spans a region and all of the availability zones within that. So we start off by defining our IP networks or our subnets that, that, that are contained there. We have to have different subnets per availability zone, um, and I'd also really recommend that you make use of public and private subnets. So not too dissimilar to having a DMZ in more traditional terms. A public subnet is something that can be routed to from the internet effectively. Private, um, by definition, is something that can't. Um, so we have to have gateways and other services that will get us out of that. Um, you can pick your own address scheme, which wasn't always the case when AWS first launched. Um, so it could be anything typically from a private address range. Um, and I'd also recommend that you don't constrain yourself to usual slash, usual slash 24 networks, that block of 256 addresses. You can go bigger than that and, and try not to contain yourself. And networking is pretty familiar for the most part. Um, you'll be building routing tables, um, although some of this even can be handled a little bit differently. So do be careful when it comes to how you attach your route tables and route precedents and so on. Um, we have networking within our VPC and it's really easy to get things talking within that. But we do also need to communicate with things outside of that, outside of that private bubble. Um, so AWS provides us with some managed services to get that traffic out, uh, they have gateway services. So to go through the internet and potentially to your data center or office sites, uh, other suppliers and so on, and the VPN gateway for that. Uh, these things are highly uh, available, they're resilient, they're scalable and, and so on. And you can apply security groups 
So security groups are effectively a firewall feature, but they're a, they're a really interesting way of deploying firewalling and, and also deserve some attention. Um, they're really flexible. The, the key thing for me is that they ignore subnet boundaries. So I come from a world previously where you would have a firewall at the edge of a IP subnet. So all traffic within your subnet would be free for all. You wouldn't have any controls around that. But then perhaps when we wanted to get out of that subnet, we drive traffic through our default gateway, i.e. a firewall, and it will be able to inspect that traffic. Um, we don't care about that when it comes to security groups. So the default is that instances cannot communicate with each other. Um, you have to explicitly allow that behavior. Where we apply security groups that can, that can allow or deny traffic between instances in the same subnet or indeed across subnets. And you can apply a security group um, to instances that are in different availability zones and in different subnets and treat them in exactly the same way. So you really get to defining it by the role that they're actually doing. Um, they're applied to the instance level or actually the interface level on, on that instance. So for example, you might have a security group which you define, which is for the purpose of allowing traffic from load balances into your web servers. Um, in that case, you will associate that with all of your web servers and, and nothing else. Um, and you wouldn't allow traffic from anywhere else either. You wouldn't allow it in from the public internet. You might then have an additional policy requirement where you need to be able to SSH or RDP to all of your instances in an environment, um, maybe from a jump box, some kind of bastion server. In that case, you'll define a different security group and you can apply it to all of your instances or a, you know, a separate group of those as well. It's worth saying that it's really scalable. So again, a problem that we certainly had with traditional firewalls is how you're gonna specify and grow those over the years. So you're investing typically in a piece of hardware uh, and that has to be able to cope with the amount of traffic today and who knows what traffic tomorrow. We just don't care about that with AWS. It, it grows and it, it scales with the amount of traffic that you throw at it. So that constraint is removed. And it's dynamic because when you launch new instances, um, particularly if you're using something like auto scaling that, that is growing your environment in response to the demand being placed on it, you can have it so that the that a common set of security groups are applied as part of that launch configuration. So you're not trying to manage complex policies and think about adding, um, you know, updating your firewall policy sets based on the IP address that a new instance is using or something like that. It just does it for you. This is really a summary of the, the native network security controls that we have in AWS. Uh, so just to give you a quick tour of those, we have security groups that we've just covered and kind of related to those network ACLs. Um, so a network ACL is more like that traditional firewall policy. It is applied to all traffic in and out of a subnet. Um, it isn't stateful, so we do need to consider request and response traffic, which we don't have to do with security groups. Um, and it won't have, it won't place any controls around traffic within a subnet either. Uh, we have WAF or Web Application Firewall, and this can be integrated with the AWS Services Application Load Balancer and CloudFront, which is the uh, content delivery network. And this is looking for attacks that, that look like genuine web traffic, but of course are not. Um, you may have heard of things like cross-site scripting, which is the ability to compromise a site that is vulnerable and use that as a, a vehicle then to deliver malicious code to other browsers of that site. Um, there's also SQL injection, which is where you compromise a site that has a relationship with the database. And this is really dangerous. You can pass data into that to try and view the contents of it, to alter those contents or even delete it. Um, so a WAF can be really beneficial in helping to prevent against, protect against those things. Um, all of the endpoints for AWS are secured using TLS. Um, and what that means is that we can be confident that when we're interfacing with Amazon Web Services, that those sessions are authenticated. So we are talking to AWS and not something else, uh, and that the session is encrypted as well. So we have those session keys agree as part of the setup, and it guards against things like eavesdropping and replay and so on. Some of the network capabilities are, are really interesting when it comes to things like spoofing and sniffing. So you can, figure, you can configure an instance to try and sniff traffic and, and get things from across the broadcast domain or the subnet. And in a traditional set data center, this was fairly easy to do. You could set a, car, a network card into promiscuous mode and you could tell it to grab everything on the broadcast domain. Um, and you can, as I say, configure an instance to do that. But the simple matter is AWS will not deliver traffic to it. The same if you try and spoof ARP requests or MAC addresses and IP addresses. AWS will only deliver traffic to your instances or to your resources that should genuinely be going there. Um, much of that is helped by something called the mapping service, and that plays a really key role 
um, in guarding against some of those spoofing attacks. Um, there is some more information out there in some of the reInvent talks around networking if you are interested in that. And finally, I wanted to squeeze in DNS here. It's often overlooked when it comes to networking, but it's really critical to a functioning system. Um, we have Route 53, of course, in AWS, which is massively scalable, highly available, and has got some interesting controls in there, not least things like low TTLs and the ability to route traffic based on, on where it's coming from or latency and so on. Okay, so we have all these great capabilities, but I do also talk to customers that want to go beyond that. Um, so for example, they may want more advanced features. So for example, intrusion prevention, application control, web content filtering, AV, data leak prevention, and so on. And these are things that are not natively available in AWS. And so you can look to other vendors, your favorite firewall manufacturer to be able to do that for you. Um, you may also have um, a lot of investment in, in other vendors too. Um, so whether that be something like Fortinet, Palo Alto, Cisco, or whatever, it's common that you'll have invested in licenses, you'll have trained people, um, you might have management systems for logging, alerting, um, and, and all sorts of different things. You may have, there's a lot of work goes into that and it's difficult to sacrifice it and just go in a completely different direction with cloud. So there can be good reasons to do that. Um, I should say that there are some limitations in deploying this in AWS. So the typical way that you will deploy that firewall is to build it on top of an EC2 instance or multiple EC2 instances for high availability. Um, so it's absolutely achievable, but you will need to be careful with things like HA and clustering. So they, they commonly depend on things like multicast, gratuitous ARP, and really network capabilities that AWS don't support. Um, you can also, so you can end up with complex scripts I've seen out there trying to reprogram the whole environment to update routing tables and, and manage where your traffic goes. Also bear in mind EC2 throughput. So different instances have different properties when it comes to the amount of traffic that they will forward. So whereas with security groups, we described how you don't need to concern yourself with the amount of throughput or how it's gonna scale, where you're gonna put inline firewalls and deploy them into to AWS, you do need to be more concerned with that. Um, so my advice there, um, there is an AWS security competency and a lot of the firewall vendors have been validated by AWS to work with that. Um, so I'd certainly check if your, your firewalling solution that you prefer is, is, is on there. Um, and, and the benefit you'll get is that it's, it's validated to behave nicely with, with VPC to support things like uh, multiple availability zones, given the, some of the networking constraints that are in place, and also to support auto scaling and friendly licensing models. Uh, finally, just to mention inline, um, firewalls, there is, there is an alternative to that, and that is agent-based solutions. And the great thing here is that you can include it in your images or your uh, configuration deployment tooling so that when you launch a new instance, um, that, that security tooling can be baked into that instance. So it scales with your environment. You don't have to worry about how you're going to route your traffic and HA, how it scales. Um, you can still have them pull logs back to a central location. Um, but it just dodges a lot of those traditional networking and scaling challenges. Plus, it will have easier access to any unencrypted data or pre-encrypted data uh, on those instances. So if you want to do more intelligent inspection, uh, you can do that too. When it comes to denial of service, this is a, a really common talking point for customers. Um, it's difficult to cram this into one slide. For those of you that don't know, uh, denial of service or a distributed denial of service attack is something where um, an attack is designed to impact availability by overwhelming a system. And it does that by sending a really high quantity of requests or traffic to your platform. Um, and it's often distributed so that it's from lots of different sources and it makes it much more difficult to, to mitigate and to differentiate between what is legitimate and what is bogus traffic. So things like UDP reflection and UDP floods as examples. Traditionally, this is hard to cope with. There are solutions out there, often where you're routing your traffic through a, a third party that's able to clean it and inspect it for you on the way. Um, I think the first thing that you get from AWS is that huge scale and high availability. Um, and everybody but gets to benefit from that as being part of an AWS customer. I've seen firsthand a demonstration where AWS soaked up a 30 gigabits per second attack um, and they demonstrated how the, the, the web application at the back end of that was able to continue to operate. And as a network uh, guide to be able to actually soak up that amount of traffic is mind blowing. Uh, so everybody benefits from that scale and it's hard to really outrun that. 
you also have this uh, system called Blackwatch, which is the AWS proprietary DDoS mitigation tooling. And this is always on in AWS. Um, it inspects all traffic and there's no external routing. It's fully integrated into AWS. So there's no need to add additional latency to get traffic to your, to your sites and route it elsewhere. Um, it tries to identify suspicious traffic. Um, and prioritize what is legitimate. So it's looking for things like abnormal sources, abnormal request rates, uh, odd ports and protocols. Um, and it tries not to necessarily drop all traffic, but to deprioritize it so that if you do have false positives, uh, you're not hitting your real customers too hard. Um, so it's re this is really hard stuff to do and the fact that you get this just for being an AWS customer is, re is really amazing. Um, a note there that you can try to outscale your attacker. So we know that we have almost limitless resources available to us in AWS. So bear in mind that there are service limits in place that you may need to, to get up by AWS. But the theory here is, can you actually just keep growing your environment if you're under attack um, to be able to soak up, um, to soak that traffic up and just outrun your attacker? Maybe, and I guess a lot of that will come down to really how deep your pockets are and how much you want to spend on that process. So do think about that in advance and think about which services are critical to you and which you might be more prepared to sacrifice. Uh, you can also think about trying to reduce your blast radius by segmenting services. So if you have more smaller resources in your environment, the thinking here is that you can aim to have a system where if a part of it becomes unavailable, it's only a very small part of it and the rest of it can continue to function. Um, just to wrap up DDoS, we have two different AWS services, so Shield Standard, and there's no extra cost for this, and that's effectively what we've described above um, here. We also have Shield Advanced, which is a paid-for service, um, and this will give you some additional tooling, um, so for example, better monitoring and detection systems, um, and there is some cost protection as well, so if you do wish to, in, to scale your way out of an attack, AWS will absorb some of the cost for that, depending on what the services are. I think for the advanced plan, the most valuable thing that you get access to is the DDoS response team. So effectively a team of specialists who live this stuff day in, day out, and they will help you mitigate and, and escape an attack. Finally, on networking, just a note to think about, uh, can you hide behind AWS? So we have these solutions, such as Elastic Load Balancer, and we have CloudFront, which is a globally distributed content delivery network. So the thinking here is rather than put your systems in the way of the internet and have them directly accessible, put AWS in the way instead. Um, that they're really good at soaking up this traffic and at blocking it and dealing with it. Um, so for example, as it shows there, um, ELB will just throw away UDP traffic because it knows it, 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 isn't, it isn't supported. Um, so it means that that will get rid of that traffic and scrub it for you rather than having to receive it on your own instances and potentially chuck it away uh, or receive it in your security groups. Think about CloudFront as well. So it's distributed around, I think, about 100 different edge locations right now. Um, and then users or any source of traffic will be automatically directed to their nearest or the lowest latency uh, location. So to be able to actually distribute an attack in that way is really attractive rather than bringing it all back to your own origin service. So even if you don't necessarily need load balancing or global content delivery, it's certainly worth thinking about using. Okay, let's have a look at IAM. Uh, this is Identity and Access Management. And this is dealing with the security of your AWS account. So access to AWS resources. Um, it's worth mentioning that this is AWS resources only and not your own application. So you'll need to think about different techniques to deal with that. So first of all, consider that there are different types of um, access into AWS. So we have the management interface or the management console, which is the web portal. We have CLI where we can interact with AWS and of course APIs where we'll have more programmatic um, application access in there. So IAM will, um, will define your identities and what permissions they have. So in terms of who the identities are, what resources they can, they can act upon, what actions they can perform. And you can start to add conditions as well. So you can um, provide limitations on what IP addresses they're coming from, the time of day, it's entirely centralized, so all of your policies are in one place and can be updated and audited in, in, in that way. And it's really fine-grained, so I'd always encourage um, looking at least privilege and not providing over generous uh, sets of permissions to individuals or users. Um, and we can be very careful in AWS and IAM with what permissions we actually grant. Uh, do bear in mind as well, it's, by, it's, de it's denied by default. 
so you have to explicitly allow certain operations if you want to allow them to, to go ahead. Um, there are two different types of credentials in the main um, in terms of users. So a user is effectively a, a person or a system that needs access to AWS and they can have a password which is used for the management console, the web portal only. If you want more programmatic access, so um, access to the CLI or APIs and here you'll need an access key. Um, my advice here is if you have users that will only ever use the management console, don't give them the access key. And that applies to the root user as well, by the way. You should never be using the root user for day-to-day -day operations, and I wouldn't expect to see access keys defined for them. Um, that said, if you have an application or something that requires those access keys, or if you're working in a CLI, consider not giving them a password. Um, that They will never use that, and it's, it's one less thing that can be compromised and, and used to target you. Um, of course, when it comes to access keys, AWS support easy rotation of those. So you can you can have two different sets of keys in place at any one time. So that if it, if it comes to the point where you want to swap it and update it, um, you can do it with very little impact. You can leave your old one in place while you go around and actually update it to a new one. Um, also consider the use of MFA as well, which adds a lot of strength to your uh, management console access. So rather than just having a username and a password, which can potentially be um, guessed, stolen, brute forced, or whatever, MFA is going to make it much more difficult to actually gain access using those credentials. We also have the concept of roles in AWS. So this is still a set of permissions, but based on um, really using temporary credentials for a user to access a resource when they need to do so. So rather than having long-term credentials that need to be managed. And on the right-hand side of the screen there, you'll see the common use cases here. So we can have cross-account access. So you may have multiple accounts or you may be working with third parties that have AWS accounts. Um, so let's say, for example, you have somebody working in a, a development account that needs to perform actions in a production account. Rather than having separate user accounts and credentials in each different account, you can you can request access uh, using the credential from one to gain access in the other. We also have federation. So typically what I mean here is well, the, the most common is federating to Active Directory. So rather than having user accounts defined in Active Directory, in AWS, maybe other cloud providers and other systems, you can use identities that are all contained in Active Directory and then use those to gain access to AWS, which is one set of permissions to manage. It's all centralized and in one place. Um, different AWS services from time to time will need to access each other. So we need to give those the, the permissions to be able to do so and that, that is handled through roles. Um, and finally, EC2, so this is probably the neatest, uh, in, in my opinion. Let's say, for example, you have some code running on an EC2 instance that needs to access S3 or do something in a service such as DynamoDB. So you could actually place credentials in that code to give it access to authenticate against IAM and, and perform those actions. Um, and I guess that's the traditional way of doing it, but the weakness there is that that, that code is stored um, and has a habit of getting out. Um, so really, the use of roles will allow us to, to dodge that problem. You tell AWS that an instance is a member of a particular role, and AWS will then be responsible for placing the credentials on that server securely, and you can then make sure that your application has access to go and get those credentials as and when they need it. Um, I'd also finally recommend using groups, and this applies to users and roles. So rather than trying to attach permissions directly to an individual user, establish a library of different um, sets of permissions in groups, and then you can, it's much easier to to make changes to those um, rather than doing it one by one. Um, you can change group membership. You can Users can be a member of multiple groups uh, too, of course. Let's take a quick look at IAM policies. So the first thing there at the bottom, as I've already said, is that we start off with this implicit deny, which is saying that nothing is allowed until you explicitly allow it. It's useful to consider too that if you have an explicit deny statement, uh, that takes precedence over anything else. Uh, so if there are certain operations that you always want to block, then an explicit deny will make sure that there's uh, no chance of mistakes there. Uh, this here that you see on the top left is a very basic IAM policy. It's based on a JSON statement. Um, this one is just allowing basic access into resources in S3, get and list operations. Um, they can be a little bit interesting to get started with. Um, so just a bit of advice about where to go with them really. So first of all, AWS has what they call managed policies and these are pre-baked policies um, and they're also kept up to date with necessary changes to make sure that they continue to reflect the original intent of that policy. And that's important when AWS are continually innovating and releasing new features and services. 
Um, so if you have something like a read-only policy uh, that applies across different services, AWS will make sure that as a new service is introduced, that read-only access uh, is preserved. Um, you can also write your own policies, of course. So you could take your favorite notepad and start to type that out. You can take an AWS managed policy um, as your template and then customize that to do what you wish. And there is also a policy generator. So almost like a wizard-like behavior. Um, you can select the service, actions, resources, and different conditions, of course. Um, and it will guide you through uh, c constructing that policy. It will spit out the JSON for you as well so that you can try to explore that and customize it further if you do need to do. There is also a policy simulator. So once you have built your policies, you can put them into this. It's like a sandbox. So it doesn't actually make actual requests on your resources, but you tell it what users or groups to simulate against. You tell it what resources to action, and it will tell you what would have happened um, had that have taken place, i.e. did it succeed or was that action denied? And it will also highlight the parts of the policy that were relevant in actually making that work or not work. Okay, let's take a look at encryption. Um, we'll try and cover this off briefly, both data at rest and in transit. Um, so data at rest, I think everybody will typically agree that encryption is generally a pretty good thing. Um, beyond being a good thing, a lot of customers are actually required to do this for some sort of compliance reasons. Um, and I guess the foundation of this is encryption keys and making sure that these are managed appropriately. And this is where a lot of the hard work has previously been. So it's really important that those keys are secured in their own right, that they're confidential, and they're also that they're highly available. So it's considering, considering a, a system that will actually take care of that for you. And it's all really hard, um, but there, there is some tooling in AWS that, that makes this a lot easier. Um, you have different choices available to you when it comes to key management in AWS. So you have a, a do-it-yourself approach. Um, there are different applications out there that you could use and different vendors that can support you. So the likes of Jamalto and Symantec do a really good job at some of this. And you can think about building and operating that yourself. Amazon have their own cloud HSM. So this is a hardware security module. Um, effectively, you get a dedicated HSM appliance or more than one that can be clustered. Uh, AWS manages the hardware, but hand over full control to you. So they have no access to the crypto functions on there. Uh, it's up to you to operate. Um, I think both of these options are going to be more expensive, potentially more difficult to manage. Um, neither of them will integrate with AWS services. So you've got more work to do in terms of uh, making it work with your code. KMS, however, as you might expect, the key management service by AWS um, is a fully managed service. So we'll give you some more information on that. Um, it's doing a lot of the hard work for you. So key generation and storage, that durability, right? it'll handle things like key rotation, the access control to it. So making sure that different users or uh, different services have got access to keys for encryption or decryption operations. Um, there's a full audit trail in place. So you can see every time a key is requested and used. And probably the main benefit uh, in many ways is the service integration. So it's almost checkbox-like integration to turn this on and to use it with different AWS services. So for example, if you want to uh, encrypt objects in S3 or in an EBS volume, you are ticking a box and you're telling the, um, that, that service to use a particular key in KMS. And it does a lot of the rest for you. Um, it's been audited by lots of different organizations. So there's a high degree of confidence um, that it is secure and fit for purpose. So for the majority of customers, I would say that this should be the starting point. Um, there are some really good white papers about the cryptographic controls and more detail about how KMS works if you are interested in that. Um, but I think the starting point is that it's uh, far easier to access, integrates really well with services, um, and it can be trusted. It's been, uh, that's been attested to by different organizations. So it's a really good example of AWS doing some of that heavy lifting. It uses something called envelope encryption, and I won't go into too much detail about this, um, but those white papers available in the security center with AWS do give you some really good information if you're interested. Um, traditional encryption is this, I mean, it's, it's, there's nothing different about the way that this starts off really. We have some plain text that we want to encrypt and we take a, a an encryption key and they apply an algorithm and that spits out encrypted data or cipher text as it's commonly known. The issue that you then have is what do you do with that encryption key? Where do you store that and how do you make it available and put your controls around it? And this is where KMS comes in. So we take that encryption key or the data key and apply another key with an encryption algorithm so that that itself has become encrypted. So 
that master key is often known as a key encryption key and it's that that we then care about protecting and it's that that is actually passed in well it, that never leaves the kms service that is where it is stored and it's stored in multiple different hsms in the background in a secure fashion and as i say we can apply strict controls into how that's accessed and, and how those operations are performed so it's it's aws doing the heavy lifting for you and unless you have really um strict compliance requirements i know in finance for example there are requirements for you know generating your own key material key signing ceremonies and those sorts of things unless you have requirements to do that sort of thing this is probably your starting point looking at data in transit um really focusing here on connecting to websites or applications and not on vpn services so you do have uh, vpns that you can establish ipsec um, and those are interesting for connecting back to offices or data centers and protecting that data in transit. Here we're looking at really looking at SSL or TLS. So SSL is commonly referred to, but it's actually deprecated. Um, so we should be talking about TLS or transport layer security, which is the successor. And there are different versions even of that. Um, this is all about um, ensuring that the host that we're talking to is authentic, that we can trust that it is what it says it is. And it, it, it ensures that the session is uh, confidential so it's all encrypted that nobody can read it if they were to intercept it or tamper with it so the, the integrity of that session um, remains intact um, it's based on certificates um, now certificates are, are, are often considered to be a bit of a hassle um, so we have this chain of trust where we we have to have a certificate signed by a trusted certificate authority and then various browsers and systems out there uh, are configured to trust those authorities so if you see something signed by a certificate authority um, you, you should know that it's good um, and where we see problems with this is it, it can be time consuming to work with it can be error prone um, we have to rotate them on a, on a reasonably regular basis um, and of course there's a cost to all of that uh, AWS has launched a certificate manager and that integrates fully with services like CloudFront uh, elastic load balancers and API gateways and it takes care of that certificate generation the deployment to your resources and the renewal for you um, and it uses a trusted CA, a commonly trusted CA, to do all of that as well. And there's no charge to use it for the, the actual use of the service or for the certificates that it generates. Um, so it's another example of AWS taking some of that hassle away for you. Um, so I'd absolutely recommend using that if you can. It makes it much easier for you. Um, I also wanted to mention TLS termination on ELB. So this is that TLS offload or... Uh, we've looked at this many times in the past um, using... Uh, hardware load balances and such in my role at Zen. Um, traditionally, the idea of the, the, the reason for the approach was to actually offload some of that expensive CPU work. So rather than having web servers or your application servers handling encrypt and decrypt operations, why not have a load balancer with some sort of hardware acceleration um, do that job for you? And, and that remains a benefit, I suppose. Um, but really the key thing for me here is that you benefit from AWS security policies what I mean by this is that we have different versions of TLS, and as I mentioned, SSL, which is deprecated. We have all sorts of different encryption ciphers that are available. Um, now, some of those are considered secure, some of those less secure, and there are different exploits uh, being released at different, different times as well. So AWS manages the, uh, those trends and keeps an eye on really what's going on out there. The, the ciphers used and the protocols used are really negotiated between a client and a server as part of session setup. Um, so using this, it means that as part of that negotiation, AWS will make sure that things that are currently considered insecure are not going to be used. Um, so rather than you having to manage, well, should I use this cipher or that one? It will do that for you using current known good practice. And that's helped to um, mitigate things like Heartbleed and Poodle in the past. And the, the AWS security teams are typically you know, really on the ball, much more so than, than a lot of customers out there. Let's take a look at logging and alerting. Um, so this is often neglected and often an afterthought. Um, of course, it's really important when it comes to troubleshooting and diagnostics, um, but also to drive that detection and responsive capability. And you may also be obliged through compliance to take this seriously as well. So we'll have a look at a few different things available to you. Um, we have logs all over the place in AWS and lots of different sources of information. So really rich in that respect. Uh, the CloudTrail service, potentially deserves a section in its own right here, but it's effectively a log of every API request that is made. And, and do bear in mind that when I say API request, there's a lot more to it than, than what, 
what, what you may think at first. So not just a direct API call uh, for your applications or scripts, but also every time you click something in the management console, that's an API, API call. Also CLI requests, um, if you have Puppet or Chef or different config management tools, if you're using CloudFormation, Terraform, even Elastic Beanstalk, um, all of these different uh, products and tools and services are going to be making API calls on your behalf. So CloudTrail will give us a copy of every action. It will tell us um, which identity made a request, when it was made, what they did, uh, which service it was against, those sorts of things. Um, and when we consider the vast array of different services and the fact that we can apply this to all the different regions, that's a really powerful thing. Um, it's definitely worth keeping an eye out for activity in regions that you don't commonly use um, because that can be an indicator of compromise. Um, we can have these logs delivered into an S3 bucket and we can also track them in CloudWatch logs. So CloudWatch logs will do things like look out for particular phrases for you or you can do counts of different events. So if you're seeing a particular deny um, action or message in your logs, you can say if I receive more than X number of those in a particular time, CloudWatch logs will raise an alert for you. You can do something with that. In terms of AWS services, most of them have some kind of logging capability that you can look at and get insight from. On the network side, one of the most useful is the flow logs from VPC. Um, if you're familiar with tools such as NetFlow or SFlow, um, you'll be fairly familiar here. So it's going to give you things like uh, a view of source and destination, destination IP addresses, ports. It will tell you what has been allowed, what has been denied, um, and so on. And similarly with ELB as well and CloudFront. Um, for CloudFront, S3 and so on, we're going to get an idea of access requests. So every time an object is requested, you'll be able to see information about that. And then we have things outside of the AWS ecosystem as well. So if you're building your own applications or using different um, software on your EC2 instances or other resources, you can get logs from those. So consider operating system logs, Apache or IIS logs, uh, and so on. Maybe even firewall logs. So if you do deploy inline firewalls or if you've got um, intrusion prevention in place, things like that, you can get logs from those. The message with this part is what are you actually going to do with those? So it's really really rich in terms of the information you can get, but you, be, you can become blinded by it. Um, there's so much of it out there um, that you've got to be able to apply them and, and do something useful with them. So you've got to think about how you're going to capture them, aggregate them. Um, it's important when you have transient resources. So for example, instances that may come and go as a result of auto scaling, make sure that you're not just storing logs on the instances because they're going to get deleted when the instance disappears. So you will need to bring those back to a central location. They need to be stored, they need to be protected so that the integrity remains intact and that they're not altered. Um, and then you'll need to use them to drive your various processes. So it might be about alerting and response and so on, alerting analysis. And there are different pieces of tooling available. So there are DIY options out there. A really common trend is the Elk stack. So use of Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana. Um, there are patterns out there where customers are using things like Amazon Redshift um, as a sort of security data warehouse um, and all sorts of other options as well. There are lots of partners providing some great tooling um, and I think this is where you'll be able to get a lot of help. So a lot of these are recommended by AWS as well. Um, but third party tools can do a good job of aggregating logs from all sorts of different services and they'll help you with analysis and prioritization and really identifying what is useful and what you should re really be looking at. Um, don't forget about some of the native AWS tools. So CloudWatch logs, uh, CloudWatch events, um, Lambda. So this is being able to run scripts off functions and you can call on these uh, and invoke these automatically potentially. And you can also use things like Athena, which will run SQL like theories against data stored in S3. Um, I think the key thing, the key message for me here is that it's, it really needs to be considered, but don't spend too much time procrastinating. When it comes to a lot of these third party tools, for example, they often have trial versions available or pay as you go licensing schemes. Um, the, we have cloud based billing models for the infrastructure that you'll put it on. So you can spin things up and give it a try, see which work well, see which don't. A lot of them are software as a service as well. So it's simply a case of just sending your logs somewhere and you can, you can really quickly get a view of what it, what it does and how it works really accessible and much more so than it ever has really. Let's move into incident response and automation. Um, so this is really all about if something unacceptable happens, if there is that deviation from normal, what are you going to do? Um, as I mentioned when we were just introducing the, the session really, 
prevention has often been the focus uh, and this is often neglected as well. Um, it becomes much easier with automation in my opinion and you have some real opportunities to be creative in AWS when it comes to this. Uh, it can still be a bit intimidating about knowing where to start um, but there's some different things that we can think about. So first of all, do consider that everything in AWS has an API and we have services such as Lambda. And that means that everything is programmable. So if you see something happen, you can very quickly uh, program your responses and you can potentially automate those responses as well. Um, so embrace AWS for those tools. I'll give you some ideas of how we can do that in just a few moments. Um, we do have that great visibility, so CloudTrail and different service logs and such, so take advantage of those. We have CloudWatch events and CloudWatch logs. Um, so CloudWatch logs, this is all about scraping your logs for interesting information and patterns and so on. And you can have alerts generated for you, which will do things like call a Lambda function, which can invoke API calls and do something interesting if you need to. CloudWatch events is gonna look at well, events in your AWS environment, and you can define what those are. So it could be that um, auto scaling has created new instances, for example, that might be considered an event, but lots of different things. And you can again have alerts triggered to do something if, if you need to do. We have config service. So config is uh, conf it's gonna track configuration state in your AWS account, and it will notify you of changes. Um, and you can also use that to understand the relationships between different resources in your account. So for example, um, if you uh, were to make a change to a security group, you can see which different resources will be impacted by that. Or if you have a problem, you can look at what has changed and what else might be impacted. Uh, we have config rules too, which is all about compliance checking. So you can define um, a set of compliance rules, which may include things like security groups must not look like this. They must be locked down in a particular way. They may say that EBS volumes must be encrypted. They must say that S3 versioning must be enabled or whatever it may be. There are some AWS uh, managed policies here, so they're pre-baked for things that a lot of customers will, customers will commonly want to look at, but you can also create your own and customize that. Um, they run on a, on a scheduled basis, basically, and if you find something that is non-compliant, you can have it alert you, or you can have it invoke a Lambda function or do something else that will actually go and, uh, and act on that automatically. So, for example, if you find an EBS volume that should be encrypted because it has a particular tag or something and you find that it isn't you could have it if you were so inclined just to go and take a snapshot of that that volume and then go and delete it something as harsh as that uh, we have guard duty which is a great newish service from aws which will monitor your environment for really um suspe suspicious activity so it might be things that look like compromised instances uh, suspected attackers and authorized deployments so this is going to get better and better as the pro as the as the product matures, um, and it uses machine learning to try and understand what normal looks like, so that it can under so that it can identify if there is some deviation from that. This will deliver alerts into CloudWatch events, and you can then go and action uh, that if you wish to do. Um, and finally, just on this um, particular slide, we have different third-party tools that we can use as well. So this is often around forensics, so tools that can help correlate and analyze uh, data and prioritize what you should be looking at. There are network sniffing tools out there if you want to look at exactly what data is coming in and going out of your instances, Wireshark as an example, and you have things that can grab data from memory, like clipboard data, netstat data, and so on, or also data from file systems, looking at what has been deleted, what has changed, and compare Comparing data on your disks to um, known exploits that are out there. It's important to have a plan when it comes to incident response. Um, and there are lots of different established practices that will help you get a start on this. But it starts with really defining some of the basics around who will be involved, which assets are important to you and which are potentially not, how you're going to communicate, who is going to communicate, um, and really just try and build up a team with particular capabilities. Think about what information you will use to detect um, that there might be a problem. So it might be flow logs, it might be config rules, and some of these other things we've spoken about. Some of the other interesting um, sources of information that might indicate a problem are things like billing alerts. So if you're all of a sudden spending a lot more money in your environment than you might like to be doing or than what is normal, apart from that being a commercial problem, that might be indicative of a, pro of a, of a compromise as well. And we have service limits, so caps on the amount of resource that can be deployed in a particular region. If you start to breach those, or if you see activity in an unusual region, that might indicate a problem as well. And finally, on the detection, think about application or business insight. 
So are you seeing more or less queries or orders than you might not do normally? Um, that, that might be an indicator of something to look at. Um, you want to contain a problem before you actually start to fix it. Um, so being able to stop it getting worse. So this is typically about isolating things, shutting it down, or whatever you need to do to stop a problem from leaking further. And of course, you'll have investigative stages where it's all about forensics, looking at logs and looking at um, copies of memory and snapshots of, of disks and such to see what has actually happened. And there's some good examples of how you can automate some of that. And once all that's been done, you can start to think about fixing, restoring, and, and, and bringing things back into service. You, I think another important thing here is about learning. So what happened, why did it happen, and how can you prevent that in future? Um, and of course, it's something that I'd really recommend that organizations practice. So um, AWS, we'll call it a game day, for example, but let's actually go and simulate a problem, inject that problem, whether it's through an alert or deleting instances or pretending that something's happened and just see how prepared you are to actually cope with that, see how people react and see if your processes are fit for purpose. Um, and that can be great fun as well. Some example responses to look at here that you might want to practice. Um, I suppose one of the classics here is leak credentials. Um, so why not plan for it? So this is some secrets or keys left in your code that somehow find themselves in the public domain. Um, at that stage, it might be that no one has actually found them or it might be that lots of, lots of people have. Um, so in terms of detection, you might see some suspicious activity identified by guard duty. You might see billing alerts and you're spending more money. Um, so first of all, you probably want to disable those commissions to contain it. And then you can start to look at, well, what access was available to that, to that user account and what was actually done. So you'll be looking at have new security groups been deployed, have uh, new IAM policies been created, have new users been created, what resources have been spun up and what have they been doing? Um, and once you understand all of that, you can start to undo that work and put yourself back into a reasonable state. Um, we've spoken about DDoS earlier, and you might detect this through traffic counts, flow logs and billing alerts again. Um, and there are lots of different things that you can do to mitigate against this. So some of that mitigation is going to be automated and you'll benefit from the great work that AWS do. But there are things that you'll also need to look at yourself, such as it might be geo-routing. So if you serve only a particular geographical region, then maybe you start to throw away traffic um, from outside of that. Or maybe you start to direct, direct that to somewhere else and protect what's really important to you. Um, you might be able to define WAF rules. And if you see specific sources of attacks, um, try and start blocking that. Um, you can use um, IP address updates, so potentially um, leave the old IP address in place on a, on, a, on a dead system that's being used as a honeypot, put new IP addresses on your live systems and attract traffic to that instead. Um, and compromised instances, so something that's been uh, hacked in some way, well, you want to isolate that first of all, so probably wrap it around security groups to make sure that nothing can get in or out of it. And that would be potentially a, a security group that you predefine um, and where you have that, um, just the ability to flip the switch and say, apply that instance to that security group, deny everything in and out. You'll take snapshots of volumes, probably shut it down, um, maybe grab a copy of what's in the memory, um, and then there's some great patterns out there where you can have pre-baked AMIs for forensic workstations. So when I say an AMI, this is an image of an EC2 server, an EC2 instance that contains all the tooling that you think you might need to be able to, to, to deep dive and investigate what has happened. Um, so you can, you can have systems that will automatically create a new VPC for you. So completely isolated, launch a forensics workstation in there and then start to attach snapshots of the volumes and start to present the, the memory dumps to that to that instance so that you can then go and out, away and analyze it. Um, and of course you can do automated, um, you, as part of that automation, you can present alerts and the results of some of those checks as well. So lots of things that you can do there. Okay, um, so a bit of a whistle stop tour, but I hope you've found that useful. Um, just a few tips and, and resources to finish off with. Um, just through what I've seen with working with customers. The first thing I would say is that security really should be everyone's job and you should make it part of your culture if at all possible. So it's not just a technology problem and it's not just the role of a security individual, but really um, you want all of your people to be thinking about this. It needs to be baked into your strategy and your processes and, and really striped across all of the work that you do. I would say start small and iterate because it can be really daunting to look at where you might be where you want um, and compare it to where you want to be. Now, security is a journey that you'll never finish. You'll never 
be complete. You'll never say, we are secure, we're satisfied with that. So you've got to really prioritize and think about what's the most important thing that we should be working on here. Deliver those things as quickly as you can and then consider where else you're weak and what else you can improve and, and work in that way, which is really typical with a lot of the cloud messaging anyway. I think, but to, to try and get it perfect from day one is really difficult. I see a lot of customers where I am identity and access management is in a poor state. So I'd really encourage focusing on this. So really this is about, I would start with the root account. Don't use it. Ensure that you have MFA uh, applied against that complex passwords and try and lock it away. Make sure that nobody's using it. Um, even with other user accounts, make sure that they're unique. Make sure that you chase the, the principle of least privilege and apply MFA as well. And finally, don't wait until it's too late. And what I mean here is that everybody wants to do security really well. Nobody will tell you that it's not important. Um, but everybody's also got other day jobs to do. They're under time pressures, budget pressures. It's really hard to prioritize some of this. So um, a, a lot of guilty of waiting until there's a really compelling reason to act on something. And that compelling reason, unfortunately, is often a security event that focuses the mind. So I've seen this with customers being hit with ransomware recently is a good example. And there's now been a lot of focus in response to that to try and get ourselves into a better state. So a cultural change is really needed to, to address that. Um, in terms of resources, I mentioned at the very start of this, Well Architected. So AWS Well Architected is a framework that has been introduced and it's been around for a number of years now, but it's aimed at trying to encourage consistency and to promote best practice in AWS environments. So we have different pillars, which you'll see across the right there, operations, security, reliability, performance, and cost. Um, and of course, security is a really important part of that. You'll see white papers for Well Architected, and in there, it does give you some great best practice guidance around all of these things, but in particular, um, security. It's also uh, something that Zen can actually run for customers. So if you are interested in us coming in and taking a look at, at your environment with you and having a discussion around how things are deployed, we'd happily do that as part of a review. Um, and we can also apply for funding off the back of that to try and help with remediation if we do find any problems. Um, so, so do get in touch if you want to look at Well Architected and keep your eyes out as well because we will be running a webinar on that in the very near future. Um, in terms of other security resources, um, the security blog at AWS is fantastic and keeps us up to date with new developments and products and services and some interesting techniques that other customers out there have, have employed. There's a compliance center, so we can look at uh, how they are certified um, and to what extent. I think it's the artifact service where you can actually request audit reports from different organizations as well if you want to really dig into the detail of that. We have best practice guides, so reference architectures. Um, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of information there about what other customers are doing and what AWS recommend. And I think my favorite source of information are the reInvent videos. So these are all published on YouTube and you have different uh, videos that go into different depth of information. So some of them really introductory and really broad. Some of them can be really focused and specific and they all give really good context when it comes to how other customers are actually using the, these techniques out in the field. Okay, so many thanks for your time. Um, I hope you found that useful. Uh, we're about to wrap up. I think we've just got a moment for if there are any questions. Okay, so I've got one question which is about federation with IAM. Um, so this is, do I need to be in, does, does my Active Directory need to be in AWS if I want to federate? Um, I, I guess you have choices to make here. So. You can have your, you can actually have a managed service in AWS that takes care of um, Active Directory for you. Um, so you, you still operate Active Directory in terms of the users and the, the groups and the organization and everything within it, but AWS will provide you with domain controllers that are managed and patched and made highly available. So you could use a service like that and plumb into it, um, but there's absolutely no reason why you can't just maintain your existing um, on-prem or external Active Directory, something nothing to do with AWS at the moment and, and federate with that. I'd probably recommend in that sense, um, establishing domain controllers within AWS if you haven't already, um, really just for performance reasons um, and, and reliability as well, just in case you do ever have a problem with connectivity out to your environment. But no, I think that would work fine. Another question on IAM, which is about if I if I can't use IAM for my own applications, what should I use? I, 
I guess AWS doesn't change a lot of this really. So a lot of the techniques that you'll be familiar with using prior to AWS are still in place. Um, although it's probably worth just mentioning Cognito, which is an AWS managed service just for this. Um, so that will give you a effectively a database of users that can authenticate to your web application or mobile app or whatever you're doing. And it will take care of some of the common operations like password resets, um, like you know, checking security information, and it will integrate with things like um, identity provi identity providers like Google and Facebook as well. So you can use identities there. Okay, um, so I think we're out of time there. So many thanks for your time. I hope you found that useful. If there are additional questions that we haven't had time to address, then we'll get back to you with those. And we'll also make sure that you have access to the slides as well. They'll be online and, and you'll have an email about that as well. Okay, thank you very much.